So please welcome Daniel. Hi, Daniel. Hello, Anisha. Hello, hello. Thank you for having me. So good to have you, Daniel. And we're looking forward to uh, your ideas on whether cross-border payments can go through with CBDCs. Of course, of course. You asked some 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 wonderful opening questions, so hopefully I'll be able to refer back to those um, as, as I go through uh, some of my talk. Uh, thank you for her for the for the wonderful opening remarks. Um, uh, like you said, I'm a I'm an advisor and solution architect with the Bank for International Settlement. Uh, I focus primarily on CBDC and uh, and particularly on cross border payments. So I think I have 20 minutes, and I'd love to. I'll just start sharing my screen um, and. I think the focus of our of our talk today um, will be CBDC and cross border payments, or I can also kind of cast this in a in a, in a light of CBDC interoperability. Uh, interoperability is likely a word that you've heard kind of thrown around uh, before, so hopefully I can shed some light on what what it means and what it means particularly in the context of, of CBDC solutions. So I think just just broadly, you know, in five in five topics on the agenda, I'll, I'll try to make an attempt at defining what interoperability is. Uh, I'll talk about interoperability both in the domestic context and in a cross border context. I'll uh, I'll provide a, a, sh a shameless pitch on what we're doing here at the BIS Innovation Hub, uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about uh, maybe some of our learnings to date and some of our uh, continued challenges in this space. Um, my I'll try to give this all kind of a technology lens. I hope I don't speak uh, in 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 uh, too much detail, uh, but I hope it's in, in, insightful and maybe peels a little bit of a layer off some of the some of the lingo uh, that's used here. So let's start kind of from a definitional perspective. Um, interoperability is is a is a term that's used uh, a, a lot and is kind of hard to unwind, and it's very contextual to what we're talking about. In general, we think about interoperability existing in three layers. So if we go from the top down, there's a business level of interoperability, there's a semantic layer of interoperability, and then there's a technical inter level of interoperability. Usually, uh, I would probably stack them in reverse. So technical enables semantic, semantic enables business, and business enables kind of full stack interoperability. Um, the, the example that, that's written down here on the slides uh, is kind of relevant to the payment space. But I think um, likely a more interesting example is this conference call that we have right now. So technical interoperability exists. You know, we're all running an application of Zoom. Some of us can be running on iOS. Some of us can be running, running on Windows. Um, there, there's complete technical interoperability between our systems because we are able to join this call. Um, the semantic interoperability is, you know, we're speaking English, um, we understand uh, certain norms of how we speak, you know, everybody's on mute while, while I'm not, if somebody wants to ask a question, they'll unmute or raise their hand, you know, things like that, we semantically understand how to talk to each other. And of course, business layer interoperability is the fact that we're talking about CBDC and payments, and we have a common business objective uh, to solve. And that is really you know, if you think about this this call, that's a manifestation of interoperability uh, right here and right now. Of course, in payment systems, it works a little bit different and it's a little bit more complex. We're moving value and things like that. But again, you can cut it into these three layers, technical, semantic, and business. What's interesting about this kind of in the payment space is that it's contextual to what we're talking about. So I want to introduce kind of two different axes of interoperability. One axis we can think of as a vertical axis for interoperability, and the other axis will be a horizontal axis for interoperability. What's interesting about these axes is that they're uh, somewhat orthogonal to each other, meaning that the where you sit on the plane on the on the vertical landscape doesn't necessarily impact where you sit on the horizontal landscape. So it's interesting to think about these two things, even though the stack is the same, they're relevant to different uh, context, one vertical and one horizontal. When I think about the vertical interoperability, I think about domestic interoperability. Uh, Herb did a good job of talking about kind of the payment stack and two-tier retail solutions. I think if we take a step back and we think about what this vertical interoperability looks like, it looks like interoperability vertically within the payment stack. And this and this is a good kind of simple visual of what this payment stack looks like. It starts from the core uh, from the center and from the core, you can think about it from the central bank, the core rule book of the infrastructure, the central bank balance sheets, and emanates out through that first tier into the second tier. And in that second tier, you have commercial banks, their payment infrastructure, their core balance sheets. From there, you can have payment service providers and outwards towards the periphery where you ultimately have merchants and end users 
um, with their various different forms of wallets and um, and um, merchant acceptance terminals uh, and things like that. So this type of vertical interoperability, really, when you think about CBDC and say, is this interoperable? If the lens that you put on is a vertical domestic one, these are the things that you have to think about. Does it integrate seamlessly through this stack and enable it? It doesn't necessarily have to be the entire stack, but it needs to work uh, with straight through processing um, for the entire stack, independent of how many layers it consumes within this two tier operating model. When we think about horizontal interoperability, the natural thing to think about is cross border uh, CBDC interoperability. I'll speak, try to motivate the topic um, briefly for cross border payments, and then we can, we can see how this vertical interoperability uh, sorry, this horizontal interoperability manifests itself. So, so cross-border payments, um, um, you know, as I'm sure a lot of you know, uh, they're, they're costly, they're complex, uh, they have high effects margins depending on what currency pairs you're looking at. Uh, they're very, there's a very uh, opaque transparency and there's heavy reporting burdens on almost all members involved. Uh, a visualization that I like is the diagram on the left when you see you know, any to send funds from any colored dot to any other colored dot representing two different jurisdictions, you would have to go through this web of correspondent banks, depending on where you lie in proximity to each other, that web of corresponding banks, of course, can be shorter or longer, where every hop along the way uh, incurs uh, cost and risk um, and things like that. When we break this down a little bit more, you can see the circle on the right represents the full amount of uh, the, the full cost. And we try to break it down to focus on where the highest costs lie. And you can see that Nostro Vostro, Treasury Operations, FX costs, and compliance are the top four. So when we think about CBDC solutions and their interoperability in this space, some of the costs that we're looking to mitigate are those top four that, that I mentioned. This isn't just a problem. Uh, what's interesting to, to think about as well, when we think about interoperability and cross-border payment solutions uh, for CBDC, I think one of the things that doesn't get highlighted enough is this notion of active correspondent banking. So there's an assumption that you know correspondent banks exist everywhere to, to some degree or the other, and it's just a question of efficiency. And I think what this diagram is, is, is kind of bringing to life is that if you look carefully at the color dots, you'll see the two color dots on the ledger on the right hand side, where the active correspondent, uh, where the active correspondent relationships are decreasing, and their value is decreasing as well. So the number of relationships and the value of funds that flow through those relationships are decreasing is is actually the majority of the world. So what we're seeing is a decrease in correspondent relationships and in correspondent funds flowing in and out of these jurisdictions. So we think about CBDC interoperability, the synonym should also be um, CBDC um, adoption and acceptance uh, and the ability for entire jurisdictions and entire countries to be integrated into the global financial system as first tier citizens. As first tier citizens. So I can't emphasize enough the significance uh, on a global stage of these multilateral and C CBDC interoperable arrangements. This also ties into the G20 roadmap. This is just a, a, a quick snapshot of it. If I had to expand this out, I see that building block E on the far right uh, is called new payment infrastructures and arrangements. And in particular, I want to draw your attention to considering the feasibility of new multilateral, multilateral platforms and arrangements for cross-border payments. Uh, and factor an international dimension into CBDC design. So a lot of the work that we do here at the hub, I think builds directly and and makes uh, actions uh, th those two um, building blocks in the G20 uh, cross-border payments roadmap. Case is pretty simple. If you look at the, if you look at the, um, it, at the arrangement today, you know, a payer would have to go to the originating bank, to the respondent bank, to the FX market, to the correspondent bank, to the receiving bank, and to the payee, and that's probably the shortest life cycle chain. Uh, in an MCBDC arrangement, what you see in the core is that you can take two payment service providers, those could be banks, plug them into an, to an FX or liquidity provider, and give them direct access uh, to each other. So you can think about this as horizontal interoperability, because potentially the CBDC that exists in the blue uh, for the first payer and the CBDC that exists in the red for the for the payee are uh, completely different systems, potentially on a technical or semantic or business level. And that's what we think about when we think about uh, multilateral CBDC um, and interoperability. I'd like to spend maybe 
two minutes uh, explaining a couple of models that we have for interoperability today, and then I'll try to build on some of these with examples of work that we're doing here at the Hub. So there's four four general models that we that we that we uh, uh, try to think of when we think about integrating and interlinking payment systems. Again, kind of on this horizontal interoperability model. So I'll read from the top left. So a single access point would be where a payment system in jurisdiction A can connect through an access point into jurisdiction B's payment system. And this access point in this example is a bank. So this could be as simple as a nostro as a, as a nostro vostro relationship with a specific entry point into a system in another region. Of course, uh, this exists today in many, in many systems. Um, you can think about kind of how this scales up um, to a larger number of, of relationships. And I think that's where a lot of the, a lot of the frictions lie. A bilateral link, if we move to the right, so a bilateral link between a payment system in jurisdiction A and a payment system in jurisdiction B, you'll notice here the lack of that bank. So it's not a single access point. It's actually taking the two systems and creating some type, type of bespoke custom payment link uh, between them to enable interoperability and movement of funds. This, of course, can work. It's a lot of work to, to build these things out. And again, not necessarily um, scalable uh, when you think about the number of, of countries and jurisdictions that would be looking uh, for this type of integration. This brings us to our two models uh, on, on the bottom. So from the left, I'll start with the hub and spoke model. Um, when you think about the hub and spoke model, what's interesting here is that you have a payment system in jurisdiction A, you have a payment system in jurisdiction B, and then you have a hub payment system in the middle that can basically consume and, and push funds out into these different payment systems. So so jurisdiction A and jurisdiction B both have their own payment and settlement systems, and there's a payment and settlement system in the middle that is the hub of, of um, the, the hub with respect to, to the different uh, spokes. The last one is the common platform. And what you'll notice here is the lack of a payment system in both jurisdiction A and jurisdiction B. It's a common platform that, that permeates out from the middle. So you have a payment system in some type of common or offshore um, region and this payment system encapsulates both jurisdiction a and jurisdiction b and it's a common platform for all jurisdictions on on the system i'm on the phone can i get two more minutes thank you sorry my phone just woke up i'm on i'm on a call thank you okay so let's talk a little bit about cbdc interoperability um, and some of the work that we're doing and i and i and i hope that i'll be able to refer back to the hub and spoke in the common platform when you see some of our work kind of coming to life. Sorry about that. It's uh, 6 a.m. here in Switzerland and my, my son just woke up uh, asking to watch a movie. Um, so very quickly, so at the BIS Innovation Hub, just to, to shamelessly plug, I think we have three kind of areas of expertise. We look at critical trends in technology that are affecting central banks. We develop public goods in this space. And of course, uh, we try to serve as a network for central bank experts on innovation. Um, so if, if, if you haven't come across some of our work that we're doing, uh, I would encourage just to go to the website and check out some of our key themes. Um, these, are, these are our center heads. This is kind of a quick map of where we are in the world and we're slowly expanding. We have seven centers now, uh, many centers of excellence, and we are uh, opening more and more centers around the world. So I look forward to, to meeting everybody in person at some point. Um, I'll talk quickly about some of the selected work and I'm just looking at the clock. I think that we have a couple more minutes left. There's four projects that I'd like to talk about. The e Hong Kong dollar um, that is, is, is near and dear to my heart working out of Hong Kong for the majority of this year. Um, that is a good example of vertical interoperability back to the domestic context. And then the other three are examples of cross-border multi-CBDC arrangements that I think are a great example of horizontal interoperability around either hub and spoke or common platform models. So I won't spend too, too much time on this. I'll just show kind of a, a, a top-down network architecture perspective for each one of these and try to show a little bit where these boundaries lie between the interoperable systems on each one of these projects. In the e Hong Kong dollar, this is a domestic technical uh, paper uh, that was done by the HKMA uh, in, in collaboration with the BIS Innovation Hub. 
the interoperability here is between the first tier of the payment stack and the second tier of the payment stack. The first tier is the interbank payment system that you can see in the middle in the darker shade of green. That's where the central bank will, would reside as the issuer and redeemer of the currency, along with the commercial banks that would uh, acquire the CBDC from the central bank and then distribute it into the second tier, which is the retail wallet system. These two systems are completely decoupled, meaning that they could be implemented in different technologies um, with different business rules and with different semantic rules as well. And they're decoupled primarily for security architecture reasons. But of course, funds need to flow in and out of both these two systems in a way that's completely interoperable. And at the perimeter of the retail wallet system, you can think about those um, user acquisition channels like merchant terminals and and uh, and retail wallets. So this is what you can think of when you think about kind of a vertical interoperable stack. This, of course, is again orthogonal to whether or not this vertical interoperability exists in the context of a horizontal interoperability, potentially connecting to other payment systems in other jurisdictions um, it, with other currency types. So this brings us to, to the second type of, of interoperability. Um, and Project Jura is a great place to start. I think I present these in chronological order. Project Jura is a project between the Banque de France and the Swiss National Bank uh, and, and the BIS here in Switzerland. Um, here you can see a snapshot of what the Jura test network looks like. You can see a representation of the Banque de France on the left. You can see a representation of the SNB on the right. And down at the bottom, you have Natixis, a French bank that's issuing commercial paper, so digital, natively digital assets into another network. And then at the core in the square box, you can see an overlay of different business networks. Now, this might look very similar to the hub and spoke model. You can see that the spokes kind of emanate out from the center and the center is the overlap of all these networks onto each other. It's in this overlapped area, in this common area that the interesting happens, things happen. Namely, what we get in this example is atomic payment versus payment of two differently issued currency types, um, potentially on different technology stacks. Um, and the delivery versus payment of, uh, of a commercial paper through the different um, participating members. I'll try to speed up a little bit because I have a couple more slides to work through. So the Enbridge platform um, is, a, is a common platform that is being built by the Hong Kong Monetary Authority, the Bank of Thailand, the People's Bank of China, and the Central Bank of the United Arab Emirates. Um, th this is the, uh, the project that I spend most of my time um, running. Uh, the, the, the network topology looks a little bit different than what we've seen before, but there's also some commonalities. You can see that this one might look a little bit more like the common platform approach, where on the common platform approach, what we see is the perimeter oval ring is the entire platform. As we work our way to the middle, you see four squares, each square representing a different jurisdiction. And at the core of those jurisdictions, they get interconnected by a group of central banks that can write uh, and, and, and support operations on the ledger. So the interoperability here is a common platform because everybody onboards onto a certain set of technical and semantic and business standards. But then inside that, you have another layer of interoperability between the different jurisdictions that can deviate on certain, uh, on, on certain attributes of the solution that they provide their users. Last but not least, I'll present Project Dunbar. So Project Dunbar is, with, is a, a joint project led by the MAS with uh, the Bank of Central Malaysia, Bank Negara Malaysia, the Reserve Bank of Australia, and the, and, the, and the SARB. And this again has four jurisdictions coming together with four different issued currency types. But the diagram here looks slightly different. Here you see that the, the, the central banks are on the perimeter issuing and redeeming into the network. And here the focus is much more on the direct peer-to-peer -peer connectivity between the, between the commercial banks and AML KYC policies that enable direct flows of funds between these banks. Here, there's a, a novel approach to, um, to uh, something called sponsored bank models, where it really asks the question of what does delivery of offshore currency look like in each one of these jurisdictions, and how can you enable a horizontally interoperable multi-CBDC platform to operate in the context of the legal and regulatory framework that exists in particular within these four regions. 
Um, so there's some interesting kind of architecture models that, that come out of this body of work as well. This is very much kind of just, just getting started. I'll wrap up quickly with some learnings and challenges and then and then and, and end here and, and hopefully I've left you with some food for thought. I think what we've shown is that um, is that multi CBDC arrangements and CBDC interoperability, both in the domestic and international cross border payment landscape is technically feasible. We've shown um, that, that, that we can reduce costs, increase transparency uh, and reduce settlement risk uh, and, and overall um, kind of introduce a lot of efficiency gains. Uh, by design, we've reduced reliance on intermediaries, we've simplified settlement process, and we're only now starting to scratch the surface on some of this process automation. And this is, you know, smart contracts, automated payments. I like the example that was brought before on uh, if you buy a flight ticket and your flight get can gets canceled, that's a great example of what process automation could look like with digital programmable central bank money. I think some of the challenges that we still have are, are on, on the viability. If we build this, will it be used? Uh, these users can be retail payments. Uh, for example, uh, in Hong Kong, there's a wonderful uh, payment scheme uh, called Octopus Cards. It's hard to see that uh, even if the HKMA would build something like this, for example, that it would be adopted at, on mass. Uh, or alternatively, you can look at the cross-border space and say, you know, can you provide more liquidity uh, with direct currency pairs that today don't exist uh, for it to be viable for correspondent banks and to challenge some of the some of the cost structures there. Um, technical connectivity and integration. This is an ongoing challenge. We've shown that this is possible, but we haven't been able to build this out at scale. Um, when we think about the scalability of the systems and the performance of the systems, that's also something that needs to be stress tested and more work needs to be done there. Uh, resilience and security, this is an ongoing challenge that, that I, I think we can be honest with ourselves that this is only really uh, at the very start. Resilience and security are often thought of as non-functional components. So you build a system and then you secure it. Uh, I think that now that we've shown the feasibility of a lot of these systems, we need to now move to show that they are resilient and secure in the face of adversarial, um, in an adversarial environment. Data governance is an ongoing challenge. Rules and regulations change uh, and are adopted very quickly in the space. And I think that's ongoing, not just for CBDC and inter interoperable CBDC work, but, but at large. Operations governments, operational governance is, is a challenge. If we think about these systems that cut across different jurisdictions, uh, operating them becomes uh, sometimes a, a challenging and fragmented set of requirements. And of course, there's legal gaps uh, that exist in most jurisdictions. This looks very different depending on which jurisdiction you're operating in. Uh, some are more advanced than others, but almost anywhere you look when you bring a platform like this and say, does a central bank have the legal ability to issue currency onto this platform? Can participants on this platform, for example, take offshore delivery of, of currencies uh, with settlement finality? You often run into legal gaps on all three of those different uh, requirements uh, and prerequisites to enable this type of solution. So I'll, I'll end with a, with a, with a final thought uh, that can maybe motiv motivate some of the work that we're doing here uh, on the CBDC space. Um, and I think that this is very timely for, for what we've seen in the, in the crypto markets. I won't read the entire, um, I won't read the entire quote from uh, Mr. Karstens, our general manager, uh, but I'll start with saying that at the core of the systems, there are central banks. And if you wind down all the way to the end, you can read that central banks and public authorities are still the glue that holds the monetary and financial system together. Private sector services and innovation are essential and should thrive on this foundation, but trust can never be outsourced or automated. So I think we have a lot of work ahead of us. If anybody's interested in reaching out and getting in touch and learning more about the work that we're doing at the hub, my email is down at the bottom. Uh, and Anisha, Anisha thank, over to you. Thank you, for, thank you for having me. Thank you so much for your presentation, Daniel. Uh, we have one question, and I'd uh, request you to uh, briefly answer this question if you can, because we have our uh, speakers waiting for the next session. Ganesh Babu Nagarajan has asked, is CBDC going to impact daily cash volumes? Can you please explain the consumer individual level impact? That's a great question. Um, I think it's to be determined. The answer is it, it could because it's a different instrument and behavior with this dis different instrument can look can look very different. But I think that's something that's that is top of mind for architects that are working in this space. And there's different uh, controls and mechanisms that you can put in place to mitigate some of the um, 
the the adversarial impacts of you know cash volume or liquidity or things like that. I, I like to think that you know if you designed cash today and tried to bring it to market, it wouldn't be a viable solution for AML KYC. There are many reasons why cash today would not be accepted uh, by central banks as a technology for issuing their liabilities and putting them into the retail space. So although we can benchmark on cash, cash also has certain legacy qualities um, that, that, that are interesting. Um, my answer is that CBDC, depending on you know, what type of impact you want it to have on deposits, what type of impact you want it to have it on um, general liquidity in the market, on monetary policy transmission, on things like that, can be designed in a way to facilitate the requirements of, of the issuing organization and, and the regulator and supervisory authorities. Well, Daniel, thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you so much for answering that question. Pleasure having you with us on the show. Thank you so much. Have a, have a nice day.